So thanks uh, and welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Alex Rangi. I'm professor at the University of Manchester, and I'm also uh, leading the In Silico UK network uh, that is trying to bring colleagues from academia, industry, regulatory affairs, um, and other uh, sectors uh, together to actually co-create and, and, and co-shape together the future of you know, pro-innovation regulations. Um, so we are funded and supported by uh, Innovate UK, uh, which is one of the uh, funding bodies from the United Kingdom and also with generous indirect support by the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Innovate UK uh, Knowledge Transfer Network. And we are very excited um, to see you all here in this event. So what I would like to do in just in the first couple of minutes is simply explain you a bit why we're here and why this event was uh, generated. And I will then also provide some further uh, postings into the chat to some additional resources among some of the things that I'm going to refer to. So in Silico UK network was set up uh, about nearly three years now ago uh, as an, as a, um, a way to provide the UK with a more focused uh, activity in the area of in silico technologies to support regulatory uh, approval of medical products all the way from pharma to medical uh, diagnostic devices, medical therapeutic devices, um, and, and software as a medical device potentially as well. And essentially has been a grassroots movement of that has grown to become really an important movement. We have a Slack workspace with over 3,000 members by the moment. Um, in January this year, we received uh, some initial funding for what we call a discovery phase for a regulatory science and innovation network uh, from Innova UK. And one of the objectives of uh, these networks is to build virtual networks of expertise in regulatory science that generate research-based evidence and insights. And what we want to do is to uh, support the community to advance regulatory science as a tool that helps policymakers to understand, identify, and assess different approaches to regulate uh, new technologies, uh, leading the development uh, to policies that best promote innovation. And in this discovery phase, in particular, what we are trying to do is um, to shape the development of the proposal to the implementation phase that only those who went to the discovery phase can, can apply to by building collaborations and partnerships, convening discussions, hosting workshops like the one we're making today and engaging communities uh, so that we, we, we sort of get a better understanding uh, about what the unmet needs are for this sector and therefore we can do uh, an optimal design of those. And one of the key uh, elements that came in a, in a survey that we did a year and a half ago is that there is um, uncertainty about the regulatory adoption of these technologies. And this is something we are addressing through some other uh, workshops that, are, that, that, that I will refer to. But also another key element was how would we will trust in in silico methods? And a number of us have you know, been reflecting on this for a number for some time, and we believe that trust comes fundamentally through two different uh, areas. One is knowledge and understanding, and that's why we are also working and developing at the moment um, a skills um, survey. So we are trying to understand what are the regulatory skills that future regulations may need and may not have today, so that we future for the workforce in regulatory affairs. Uh, and I will post the survey so that you can contribute to this. And the second one was trust is based on the credibility of the models that we develop. And this is what the focus of this particular uh, event will be, is, is what does it mean, credibility of a model? How do we can assess credibility? And to that effect, um, you know, I've been cheeky enough to um, enroll a number of American colleagues uh, that have done a very interesting event a few months ago uh, in the US that I felt essentially spoke to the essence of that, and not just from a theoretical point of view, but also with examples and with a possibility for people to put questions. So this will be delivered in three sessions, and uh, I will hand over um, in a moment to to Jeff to to pick up with the session of today, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure that you will be really uh, delighted to, to, and you will learn a lot from this session. So my final pitch is, please don't forget to answer the poll if you can. We are nearly there with 73 out of 79 answers, so thanks. You've been fantastic in answering all of those, and I can tell you we have a big, big participation from industry, which is great, from regulators and academia, um, and this is uh, excellent.
Well, with that, uh, I'd like to say a big thanks to Jeff and Linda and Paimon and Mark. Um, we're going to be your your um, host in the remaining of the session. Thank you. And over to you, Jeff. All right. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. Give me just a second here to queue up my screen. Is that coming through OK? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, so the, the theme of the session today is on the ASME VNV40 standard, which was published in 2018. Um, my name is Jeff Bischoff. Um, so my uh, we lost my day job. Share, Jeff. Just lost the screen share. Okay, hang on just a second. At least on my side. There we go. Is it back? Yep. Okay. All right. So so my name is is Jeff Bischoff. I, I work with Zimmer Biomet, which is a, a device manufacturer in the musculoskeletal space. Um, I lead a team of biomechanics researchers, including a group that's focused on modeling and simulation. Um, Zimmer Biomet is, is blue is our color. Um, most everything you're going to see in this slide, though, is, is purple. So, so I'm presenting this not as, as someone who is um, within a medical device company, but, but more principally as the current chair of the VVUQ40 subcommittee on VVUQ and medical devices. Um, someone who's been a part of this committee um, almost since its inception about 15 years ago, and, and someone who is still very passionately um, believing in what we are trying to do uh, with standards like this to advance the use of model and simulation within the medical um, device ecosystem. And then thinking about how to frame the, um, the, the webinar today, um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a chance here. And uh, as, as Alex mentioned, um, I'm from the United States. Uh, the others who are also presenting are also from the United States. Uh, a, a relevant <clears throat> contemporary um, event that happened in the United States last night was the first uh, presidential debate. And uh, a couple themes came out of that debate, which I want to reference within the context of, of this uh, webinar here. So consider this my, my opening statement, if you, if you will. Um, so, so one of the themes that, that comes out quite a bit is the idea of, of fact checking. Um, don't need to say anything more about that in regards to the debate. What does that mean in terms of this webinar here? Our goal between myself and Payman and Linda and Mark is to be, in fact, 100% factual, right? Our goal is to share with you uh, the details about the ASME BNV40 standard 100% um, factually. When we get to the end though, and all along the way, I think you will see that there remains subjectivity within the framework um, that is embedded within VV, uh, VNV40. We need to embrace that subjectivity. That, that's a theme that's gonna come out, um, I think several times during the course of the next um, hour and a half. So that was, that was theme one, um, fact checking. A second theme that came from the, uh, the debate last night was this whole idea of, of personal attacks. Um, it is our commitment here that we are not going to engage in any personal attacks. Um, but I bring this up because I want to highlight that, as mentioned, I'm from Zimmer Biomet, which is a, a device manufacturer in the orthopedic space. Another one of the presenters is from Depew Synthes, which is a direct competitor within the musculoskeletal space. Uh, you will see on the final slide of this presentation, we have had representation within the VV40, now the VVUQ40, from almost every major player in the medical device space that in the, in the device, in, in, the, in the, the market of medical devices, right, we are very competitive with each other. But what it brings us together is the shared belief that there's this pre-competitive space, that this, this belief that we can more generally, again, advance the use of monolin simulation in a responsible way, in a good way to get better devices, better therapies out to patients. Um, that's the pre-competitive space um, in which we believe um, in, in which we live within the subcommittee. So with that, we're, gonna, we're not going to have any, any personal attacks during the course of the next um, hour and a half. Uh, 
The third theme that I want to speak on is a whole idea about optimism for the future. Um, if, if you listen to the debate, um, who knows how optimistic you are about the status of things here in the United States. But I'm here to say that hopefully by the end of this webinar here, um, you will share our optimism in the pathway for expanding the use of monolith simulation. Um, I think with this standard, which was published six years ago, with the guidances that you will hear next week from the FDA, with other activities such as in Silico UK and others in the EU, um, there's a lot of effort to clarify pathways within our larger ecosystem to use MS responsibly, credibly to advance medical devices. Very optimistic about the future. Um, I hope that comes through in the presentations uh, today and also uh, next week. All right, now I will get off of the, the debate and, and get on to um, the, the topic here, uh, which is the, um, the VBEQ40 standard. So we have about two hours allocated to this. Um, you'll see here the, the rough agenda. So I'm going to start out, uh, give a little bit of the history that led to the publication of the standard in 2018. I'm going to talk about uh, three of the core concepts, context of use, risk, and credibility. Um, at that point, I'm going to take a break. And then uh, Mark and Payman and Linda are going to do deep dives into specific aspects of the credibility framework. Mark will be talking in great detail about verification. Payman will be speaking about validation. Linda will be speaking about applicability. If these terms don't mean anything yet, um, by the time we get there, uh, they, they should be quite clear. Once that's done, um, then I will wrap up with about 15 minutes of, of, again, making sure that within this, we don't lose lose track of the, of the bigger points with all the details, talk about some things that are ongoing. And then for the balance of the two hours, uh, we can have some question and answers, hopefully, with, with all of you who are participating today. So, so with me today, um, you, you see these three other folks. Uh, so Mark Horner from ANSYS, Payman Afshari from Depuy Synthes, and Linda Knudsen also from Zimmer Biomet. Um, you see all of us are, are now and have been and continue to be uh, very active leaders within the VV UQ40 subcommittee. Um, and, and so we, we, I think we have, a, we have a good set of people here to uh, share what this standard is in, in theory and in practice. So to now get into, um, get into the, to the standard itself, when, when we started this process around 15 years ago, and, and maybe to some extent still now, there were a lot of terms being thrown around that you see here, but all framed around this, this basic question of what is the evidentiary bar for computational modeling? If we want to use computational models uh, to support medical device development through evaluation of concepts, through verification or validation, through commercialization, what bar do we need to achieve in terms of the verification or the validation or the credibility of these models? There was not a lot of guidance around this, even though a lot of people at this time, a lot of companies at this time were, were performing simulations in support of this. And so acknowledging this, this ambiguity that was in place 15 years ago, um, th this was the landscape in which the VNV40 subcommittee was formed back in 2011. The subcommittee is now called not just VNV, which is verification and validation. Um, it is now extended to VVUQ, which is verification, validation, uncertainty, quantification. But in the early form, it was, it was the VNV40 subcommittee that was our charter. And within ASME, we spent about three years rallying support, trying to understand if there's a need for activity here, what that need is, and what constituents within the medical device ecosystem um, would be interested in, in joining this journey, essentially, to development of a standard. After that was formed, we then spent about five years developing the guts of what was finally published in the NV40. Uh, we had some missteps. We went down strategies that when we thought more about it, when we started doing things in practice, those strategies didn't bear out. It was all in all about five years of development with a large set of representatives from 
mostly from industry, also from regulatory bodies, um, some from academia, to develop the guts of the framework that, would, that was finally published. And since between 2016 and 2018, right, that two-year period, um, already at that time, we saw within the subcommittee that the framework that we've encoded within the standard, there are some tricks to applying it in practice. And the more that we can provide practical examples of how to use the standard, the, the better the adoption of this is going to be. So as we were pushing this through to publication, we also added into the standard, the main body of the standard, six device specific examples, which were intended to illustrate practical application of different aspects of the framework. Those examples ended up doubling essentially the text within the standard. Um, we see now, you know, six years down the road, that those examples aren't perfect, um, but they're out there and they're in place and hopefully providing a little bit more practical guidance um, to application of the standard. And then in 2018, after uh, public review, after internal review, lots and lots of comments from the community that came in and were addressed, um, we finally published this late in 2018. And so what we are talking about today is that standard as it was published in 2018, as it is now. That is our goal within the next hour and a half. This is the fundamental flowchart within VNV40. This is something you will see several times during this presentation. And this envisions basically a, a, a prospective view of if I want to use modeling simulation in support of some device application, I want to think about this clearly up front. I want to think about what is my question of interest? What is my context of use? I will define these terms a little bit more later on. Once the context of use is in place, I want to think about the idea of risk. We know what risk generally means within medical device development. We have a refined definition of risk, specifically as it applies to computational models that we will use here. Once we assess the model of risk, we can use that to modulate the extent of verification, validation, uncertainty, quantification activities that we ought to do in order to ensure appropriate credibility of the computational model. So those things are envisioned to be really a, a, a prospective thought exercise to lay out a plan within establishing the risk-informed credibility. Once we have that plan, then we go about the activities, the process of gathering that credibility evidence. Once we have all that evidence, then we take a look at it we take a look again at the intended use of the model, the context of use, and we make sure that we have achieved the level of credibility that we think we need for the context of use. Once that's done, then we are, then we are confident that we can use the, um, use the model we've developed for a contemporary medical device application. So that's the overall framework as we see it for a prospective evaluation. Three of the I think the, the, the new features within that flowchart that I'm going to talk about here are context of use, which I've mentioned a couple times already, model risk, and credibility. And what we want to do in the end is make sure that all these three within the context of a particular application are tied out together. That's the end goal. So let me get first into context of use. So Context of use as we've defined it within VNV40 is a statement that defines the specific role and scope of the computational model used to address the question of interest. That's how we define it. Let me give an example of this. So within my space of musculoskeletal devices, this, this is a, a, a typical representation. This is, these are several different um, designs for a hip stem for total hip arthroplasty. A very common application for modeling and simulation in support of devices like this is to evaluate what is the worst case within this family in terms of some metric. So when we think about context of use, right, a statement that defines the role and scope of the model, I could start out and say, well, I want to do simulation. I want to do, in this case, find an element analysis to address this. My COU, my context of use, is the model will be used to evaluate the stress across all sizes of a hip implant system. That's a, a good effort. It's a good first step. It's something that I would have put down as a COU 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, but there's more involved here that VNV40 wants to get into. 
So we're going to evaluate the stress across all sizes. What are we going to do with those evaluations, with those predictions? We're going to use those stresses to identify a worst case size under fatigue loading. We have five, we have 10, we have 15 different sizes. We want to identify which one is the worst case size. Okay, that's great. What are we going to do with that worst case size? We're going to then put that in the lab and we're going to test it under fatigue loading to ensure sufficient strength. Okay, that's good as well. So now we know um, what is the strength of this particular worst case. What are we gonna do with that result within the context of the device? We are then going to evaluate that strength relative to the performance of a clinical benchmark device to finally render a decision on whether this system is sufficiently strong uh, for the expected physiological use. This is, the, this is the idea of the context of use. Don't stop at, we're gonna use modeling to evaluate a hip stem, right? Go into every step to evaluate in, 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 very, in as much clarity as you can, what you're evaluating and how you're going to use the results from the study. So this example here, this case study of a worst case determination within my space of, of, of orthopedic devices is a very common uh, case study. We, we do this a lot. We're pretty comfortable doing these sorts of evaluations. The use of VNV40 can help to do these sorts of worst case evaluations. But I would say that a big driver for the development, the publication of VNV40 was yes, to support these sorts of things, but also to support expanded use of modeling simulation beyond these traditional examples. And so in this case here, where we take modeling to determine a worst case and then we test the worst case, what if we wanted to use simulation completely in lieu of final fatigue testing of the system, right? That's a new and emerging context of use that the VNV40 framework could support in terms of laying out what is the credibility evidence if you want to lean more on the model and simulation to support a, a strength evaluation. What about models in support of patient-specific planning? Uh, what about models in support of in silico clinical trials, where maybe there's the opportunity to use virtual cohorts to augment or to replace clinical cohorts to evaluate the clinical performance of the device? What about digital patient twins, right? Where we have a model of a particular patient, we are getting data from that patient all along the continuum of care. We're refining that model and we're trying to use that model to continue to guide uh, appropriate interventions for that patient. These are all some of the very interesting and emerging applications in modern simulation that we can frame COUs around and we can use VNV40 to help frame what the credibility um, expectations are for those different COUs. These are all very different though. How are they different? That leads to the second of the three topics here, which is model risk. So model risk as we've defined it in VNV40 is the possibility that the computational model and the simulation results may lead to an incorrect decision that would lead to an adverse outcome. There are two independent factors that contribute to model risk within the VNV40 framework. Um, I have two figures here. They both illustrate the same concept. Uh, one is a bit more of a continuum. The other one now is very clearly discretized into ones and one to five. But the key factors are model influence and decision consequence. These are the two things that we need to identify independently for our context of use in order to define what the model risk is. And for either one of these, if the model influence increases or the decision consequence increases, the associated model risk also will increase. Maybe not linearly, maybe not additively, but it will increase. So what exactly are model influence and decision consequence? So model influence as we've defined it is the contribution of the computational model relative to other contributing evidence in making a decision. Think back to the COU from a slide or two before about the worst case evaluation of hip stems. What other evidence was coming into play to make that decision? We were planning to do physical testing of the worst case. We were planning to evaluate the performance relative to predicate device. 
these sorts of considerations help to modulate model influence. The stronger the influence, the more the influence, the more the associated risk with the model. Decision consequence, we define as the significance of an adverse outcome resulting from an incorrect decision. Um, and I'm sure many of you, when you read this, you will recognize that that is very much the same thing as the idea of risk defined in ISO 14971. This connection is a little bit lax in, in the VNV 40 standard as it was published in 2018 um, in a planned revision, which I will talk about later. We're gonna draw that connection uh, much more directly, but if you view decision consequence within VNV 40, as, as the same idea of risk within ISO, um, I, th I think you basically um, underst understand the intent here. So both of these contribute to um, model risk. How do you evaluate them? Well, within VNV40, for these, as well as all the different factors that we will consider later in this seminar, we propose a set of gradation factors. And so the factors that we have within VNV40, which you don't have to use, you're not obligated to use, um, but there's, they're, they're a starting point for defining factors that, that may be relevant for your particular um, space. Uh, the lowest is that simulation outputs from the computational model are a minor factor. The highest is a significant factor and middle is moderate. Um, this naturally leads to the discussion of, well, what exactly is minor or moderate or significant? Um, that's a very good question. And this is one area where I, I mentioned the examples in VNV40. Uh, those examples are intended to give a little bit more context about how you might interpret minor or moderate or significant. Um, the examples also give ideas about, okay, this is one set of gradations that are appropriate for model influence. There are other, other gradations that can be used. Um, so when you're applying this in practice, the first thing is, are you going to use these as they're written or are you gonna come up with a different set of model influence factors that are more germane uh, to, to your space within the medical device uh, ecosystem? So those are the gradations that we have for model influence. Uh, decision consequence, you can see here. So the lowest level of decision consequence is that an incorrect decision would not adversely affect patient safety or health, but might result in a nuisance to the physician or have other minor impacts. The highest level of decision consequence is that the incorrect decision could lead to severe patient injury or death or other significant impacts, and then you have an intermediate level. Whether this is the right system for you, whether three levels is appropriate, whether you want to have five levels or 10 levels, there is space with an application of the VNV40 framework to customize that, but the principle remains the same, that you have factors, levels for model influence and decision consequence, lay out those levels, and then evaluate your COU based on those levels and then feed that into model risk. Okay, so that's great. So now we have our context of use defined. We've evaluated the model risk associated with that context of use. Now, what do we do? Well, now we let's take a look at credibility. And very generally, as, as I think you could anticipate already, even if you haven't seen the standard at all, the higher the risk associated with the model, the more credibility we need, right? And credibility as we define it, is, is the trust established through the collection of evidence and the predictive capability of a computational model for a context of use. If the model risk is higher, we need more trust in, um, in the predictive capability of the model. I'm gonna take a little bit of a detour here to define a couple terms um, related to verification, validation, applicability, which are the, which are the um, items that we incorporate within credibility. So just to level set up expectations here, these are some key terms. Um, so when we talk about verification, verification we define as, as did you solve the underlying mathematical model correctly? Um, this is primarily a mathematical exercise. When we think about validation, validation is does the model actually correct, uh, correctly represent the reality of interest? What is the reality of interest? Well, we need some sort of experimental data, some sort of clinical comparator that we compare the model predictions to, to address validation. As we start to do these, we recognize that there are various uncertainties showing up within the model, as well as the comparator. When we talk about uncertainty quantification, we are contemplating what is the uncertainty in the inputs and what is the resultant uncertainty in the outputs? 
UQ shows up both for models and for experiments. And we'll talk a little bit more about that within the validation portion of, the, of this seminar. The other, another concept is applicability. So if, if, we, if you can imagine doing verification activities and you imagine validation activities, how close are those activities relative to the actual model that you want to use to evaluate the context of use? You're finally going to evaluate a device or several devices. You want to understand the response of the device. All these VV activities, how close are they to what you finally intend to use the COU for? That's the idea of applicability. And then credibility is sort of the, the, the encapsulation of all these things. We have evidence that we get through very specific verification or validation or UQ activities. We look at those results through the lens of applicability. And then we take all of that to make an assessment of the credibility of the model. Do we trust the model to the level that we need to based on the risk? So with those, with those five terms defined, let me come back to how we approach credibility within VV40. So as I mentioned, we have three uh, specific contributors to credibility, verification, validation, and applicability. We're going to talk about each of the three of these in much greater detail as we go through the next hour. I'm just going to give a, a high level view of this. Within verification, we break verification into both code verification and solution verification. Is the software working as we intend it to be? Are we using the software as we ought to be using the software? Validation is framed around three specific components. So when we think about validation, we generally are doing something with a computational model. We have some sort of benchmark data and we're doing some sort of comparison between those. So we have the model, the comparator and the assessment, all of which can increase or compromise credibility associated with uh, the overall approach. And then finally, we have applicability. And applicability is, okay, we've done these VNV activities. We've done some experiments. We've done some models. We've taken a look at them. How close are those to the actual context of use, the devices that we want to evaluate, the physics that we want to evaluate within our COU? All this, then, is intended to not answer the question, is the model validated? That's not the question we're trying to address here. Validation is a set of activities that generates a set of results. The question that we really want to address is, is the model credible for the stated context of use based on evidence from verification, validation, and UQ activities? So that's the fundamental idea behind credibility as we use it within the NV40. Within credibility, there's a lot there. So a big chunk of the next hour, Payman and Linda are going to be talking about these independent factors um, and, and Mark. So, so Mark's going to be touching on verification, code and calculation as I laid out. Payman's going to be talking about validation, computational model, comparator, and the assessment. Linda's going to be talking about applicability. Each of the credibility factors that you see on the right has text in the standard. We're going to go through those here. We're going to define what they mean. We're going to lay out potential levels for evaluating these. We're going to get pretty much into the details. As you go into those details, keep in mind the big picture, how all of these feed into an assessment of overall model credibility. And we're going to evaluate whether that credibility is appropriate based on the risk associated with the COU. OK, so with all that being said, um, that's the intro. I am now going to hand it off to Mark from ANSYS, who's going to do a deeper dive into the verification credibility factors. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. If you could, oh, someone disabled my slide share. Maybe, Jeff, you have to stop sharing and then I can share. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Now? OK. Yep. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the overview, Jeff. Really appreciate it. As Jeff mentioned that. Uh, Mark, we're not seeing the, the slideshow presentation. Oh, there it is. Okay. We're good. Okay. Maybe a little lag here, um, but hopefully it's okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I'll go through the verification steps then. So, to go and get started then, you know, the question that we're answering, as Jeff mentioned before, is really, you know, one kind of 
short way of thinking about is was the problem solved correctly? And as Jeff mentioned, there are two elements to verification. One is code verification, which helps us to identify errors in the source code, as well as the numerical algorithms of the source code. And another important element of code verification, which you often hear me talk about, but it doesn't always show up in the um, uh, definition explicitly, is code verification helps us to ensure that we're using the code correctly and we understand how to apply that code for getting class problems. And then the second and then, uh, verification is calculation verification. So in that case, we're looking to estimate numerical errors in the discretization, uh, discretized problem, sorry, and then also ensure that the inputs and the outputs um, have been uh, entered into the code correctly and then extracted from the code correctly and reported. Um, as Jeff mentioned, uh, code verification and calculation verification are explicitly called out as hey, Mark. Uh, activities. Um, Mark. Yes? We are yep. having a pretty shaky audio from you right now. Ooh. I don't know if there's anything on your side, if you okay. can to address it, but a couple people, including myself, it's it's a bit flaky. Let me, there's no one else on the internet here, but let me do this. I'll turn off my video. Let's okay. see if turning off video helps. That sounds better right away. Yes. Can you hear me Thank more you. clearly now? Perfect. Okay. All right. Yeah, really sorry for that. Thanks, Jeff. Um, do I need to start over or just keep going from here, I guess? I think keep on going. Okay. Yeah. So then when it comes to verification, these are two sub activities under verification um, ex that are explicitly called out uh, within the VMV 40 standard. Also, it's important to note from a regulatory perspective that code verification and calculation verification are called out as important elements of a modeling and simulation report that you might send to the FDA. Um, and the report uh, specifically that I'm referring to was uh, laid out in an FDA guidance called Reporting of Computational Modeling Studies in Device Submissions. Um, the goal of this report was to help ensure more consistency in the information that was being conveyed from medical device companies to the FDA. Um, and the hope was that if there was more consistency in the modeling and simulation reports that were coming into the center, then there would be more predictability and consistency in the regulatory review process. Uh, this guidance document will be covered in more detail next Tuesday in part three, if I remember correctly, by Kenny Acock and others. Um, a really interesting observation, and I don't want to scoop Kenny's story. I don't know if this will be talked about as well, um, but because there is a focus on verification um, within this um, a peer reviewed journal article that was published by FDA a few years ago. I did want to highlight uh, a metadata study that was performed by FDA uh, where they analyzed uh, submissions that were coming into the center, if I remember correctly, over the years 2013 to 2018. And what they found was that, you know, when they analyzed the, just the content of those submissions, things that were missing in the reports were related to things like code verification as well as calculation verification. So out of the 65 reports that were analyzed, only three, three reports contained information related to code verification, whereas nine um, you know, contained information related to mesh convergence studies. Now, you know, one of the things that Jeff just talked about is that um, you know, the amount of work that we have to do is risk-based. And in fact, there may be times when uh, it's possible to not have to incorporate code or calculation verification into your submission. I would argue that, you know, the code verification is something that uh, may be appearing in a submission less frequently, um, but certainly mesh refinement studies are something that we think should be reported as a best practice pretty much in every submission to provide confidence in the data. Okay, so as Jeff mentioned then, we'll be going through the individual credibility factors associated with each of the different activities, verification, validation, and applicability. And then it's on me uh, to talk about those that are associated with code and calculation verification. So we'll go through these one by one over the next 10 or so minutes. So the first one is related to software quality assurance. And in this case, what we want to ensure with uh, SQA is that you know, the code is performing correctly and produces repeatable results, both on uh, you know, the, the, the uh, computers that are used by the software developer or vendor um, when they're developing the code, but then also um, you know, when you're applying them on your system. Now, one of the issues that we run into with software quality assurance is that 
with commercial off the shelf code, it's difficult to implement your own uh, software quality assurance process. Um, that code essentially is conveyed to you uh, after you get a license of that software. And then, you know, you really can't see inside the code, nor are you really doing any development activities associated with the, you know, um, the source code. So typically what we rely on when it comes to commercial off the shelf code are ISO 9001 certifications from the software vendors. Um, one thing I did before, you know, um, uh, you know, one thing I did in preparation for this presentation was, you know, uh, working at ANSYS, I knew we had ISO 9001 certificates, but then I also went to some of the more common codes that we see being used within the medical device industry, just to see if they were also publishing or sharing that kind of information. And so here are some of those examples here with hyperlinks. So if you are interested in finding, you know, more information associated with software quality assurance, um, you can go to these certificates to get more. I would say that if those aren't published online uh, by a commercial off the shelf company, then that's something you could probably write into their support team or other team and see if you can get that information. I'm sure everybody's going through uh, some similar process. Now, um, you know, when it comes to uh, modified off the shelf code, what we're talking about in that case is a commercial off the shelf code, which you've modified maybe to incorporate a custom material uh, or other, you know, capability that's not in the code. So in that case, you've made a modification. Now, um, for the modified off-the-shelf code, when it comes to that standard uh, source code that you downloaded and are using as an executable, you know, we're still relying on the ISO 9001 certificate, um, but you, it's up to you as the user then to ensure the quality of that user-defined function or other capability that you've implemented into the code. And then it's specifically up to the user for user-developed software. And so you can see, um, you know, within the gradations that we provide within the VMV40 standard, depending on risk, you may or may not have to go through SQA procedures for low risk scenarios. For a medium risk scenario, you might perform SQA procedures and, and then document those. And then finally, at the highest risk, you need to specify and document those. And then also um, for high risk scenarios, you might go through the software quality assurance manual and uh, try and find any identified bugs within the code and ensure that that uh, that the bugs that you do identify don't conflict with capabilities that you will be accessing as part of your context of use simulations. So that's something that's very important to identify. Um, next, we go on to code verification. Uh, and in this case, you know, the, the factor is numerical code verification. And so what we're looking at here is ensuring that the code uh, is providing accurate solutions to known problems. And going back to what Jeff was talking about with debates, in the case of numerical code verification, there can be no debate. Um, and the reason for that is what we're doing is typically taking uh, problems with known analytical solutions and comparing the output of the code to those analytical solutions to ensure that we're getting accurate answers. Um, as part of that, you'll perform uh, mesh and time step refinement studies. Um, and that, what that will provide you is an understanding of how fine of a mesh do you do you require to get towards that analytical solution result. Um, depending on the risk, you may also calculate discretization error. So that's the difference between the solution you're getting from the code and the known analytical solution. And then for higher risk situations as reflected in the credibility factor you see at the bottom, you might also calculate what's called the observed order of accuracy. Um, and, and now, you know, one example of this I can give to you being a chemical engineer and having done a long career in computational fluid dynamics is that when we solve CFD problems uh, for those CFD years out there in the crowd, you may be familiar with first order and second order upwinding. And through first order upwinding, what you'll expect to see is a first order rate of, of convergence towards the analytical solution in your problem, whereas if you choose second order accurate upwinding, then you'll see a second order rate of convergence. Okay, and then the things I talked about, you know, just above are reflected in the credibility factors you see in the VMV40 standard. Low risk scenarios, we won't perform the NCV. Uh, for medium risk scenarios, you might compare to an accurate uh, benchmark solution from another verified code. One of the weaker forms of code verification, but it is out there. Um, C is then you do a uh, discretization, discretization error calculation by comparing to an exact solution where you know that exact solution and can calculate uh, the difference and ensure that the numerical solution asymptotically approaches that solution. And then finally, you can also calculate the observed order of accuracy in those higher risk scenarios following the, you know, uh, 
the discussion I just spoke about with that last bullet. I'll give you two examples of numerical code verification. One's really interesting because it's related to the mesh. And this is one that Ishmael Guler had put together uh, for the previous seminar. And so what he talked about here is that, you know, let's say we're trying to just, just using the mesh discretize a, a circle. And so we have a known radius of the circle as well as a known area. And for uh, a very low discretization, when we calculate the area of that circle, we're obviously going to get an area that's not representative of the area that we expect to get, which is pi. Um, and and this, this situation is kind of interesting because I think we often see it come up when we're using uh, data that might come from imaging. Um, so in that case, you extract that data from a, a, you know MRI or CT scan using segmentation software. Usually the result of that is an STL. And the question is, you know, how representative is that STL file that you're getting from that um, from from the segmentation of the actual anatomy? Um, so anyway, what uh, Ishmael looked at was, you know, as we decrease the element size, we see that the discretization error decreases. We know the exact solution, which is pi. But then what he also showed is that he's calculating the the rate at which the solution approaches the correct solution of pi. And what he sees is that he does, in fact, get that second order accurate rate. And that's what he expected based on the based on the refinement scheme that he used for the meshing. Now, something that digs in a little bit more to a physical problem, again, coming back to kind of my background in chemical engineering, is pressure driven flow in a pipe. So in this case, we're able to write down a very simple analytical solution for that, which, which we call parabolic flow. And so, you know, we can, uh, when we solve for that numerically, we get the typical CFD result of, you know, zero velocity at the wall, which increases to the maximum velocity at the center line. The shape of this looks somewhat like a parabola, which is why we call it parabolic flow. So now what, we, what I did was to go through a code verification study where I have a sequen sequence of meshes which are refined in element size by a factor of two. So I'm reducing the average element size by a factor of two as I go from mesh one to two, two to three, and three to four. And what we see is that, you know, the, the just so you know, I didn't put it in the slide here, but the uh, analytical solution for the velocity magnitude at the center line is two. And we see that we're slowly approaching that as we refine the mesh. So already for a medium risk scenario, and that would be credibility factor uh, C, we see that we're kind of slowly approaching that analytical solution. Now, if we were in a higher risk scenario, as I mentioned before, we would have to calculate the observed order of accuracy. And what we see for this problem is that, in fact, we do reach that pretty quickly. I use second order upwinding in my problem. The observed order of accuracy is two. Therefore, you know, we do have, even at a high risk level, we have verified that this code is working correctly. Um, oh, and then just highlighting and relating back to the credibility factors, then you can see as we go from A to D. In fact, in this case, really what we're showing is a medium risk scenario for the velocity magnitude. This is really representing credibility factor C, and then the observed order of accuracy is representing credibility factor D. Um, one, one problem that we often run into is having sources of examples that we could use for numerical code verification. Um, I did have access, you know, working at ANSYS to our verification manuals. So in this case, uh, if you were using ANSYS technology, you could access those verification manuals, which provide you with uh, uh, problems with known answers. And you can run those problems on your local compute system to ensure you're getting the correct answer as published in these manuals. Again, I have access to these manuals because I'm working at ANSYS. I'm sure other manufacturers also have sim similar manuals available for their customers. Okay, next step then is to talk about discretization error. Discretization error is very similar procedurally to numerical code verification in that, in this case, we're going to go through a mesh refinement study. The difference being, though, we don't know the exact solution, typically, right? So we're not going to know that exact solution. That's something that we can actually estimate as part of a discretization error study. Um, within the VMV40 uh, you know, framework, from low to high risk, what we talk about is uh, offering options for no grid or time step convergence analysis being performed. Uh, gradation B says we can uh, do the uh, uh, grid or time step convergence study and look at the uh, convergence behavior and ensure that it's stable. And then finally, at the highest level, we're not only ensuring it's stable, but we're estimating the dis discretization error. And how that's done, uh, there's a procedure known as Richardson extrapolation that will allow you to estimate the uh, exact solution at infinite mesh resolution 
and that will then enable you to calculate an estimate of the discretization error. For the sake of time, I don't have an example, um, but there are some nice published papers in the literature that can take you through that. Um, one paper I'm highlighting here, and I know I just talked about the uh, Richardson extrapolation, so I apologize. They didn't go through that process in this study, but I like to highlight this paper because you know, what they did here was to go through a rigorous uh, calculation verification study for a medical device example and highlight some of the challenges that you run into when doing that. So again, relying you know, more on the fluid side, some of the things you run into when modeling flow, in this case, through a centrifugal pump are things like flow stagnation. Um, you also are very interested in, in an example like this in shear stress, which is a derived quantity as opposed to a, you know, a degree of freedom like velocity or pressure. And this could introduce a number of challenges. Um, so you know, when it comes to getting the converged result for shear stress, they, they found within the study that they had to go to very high mesh resolution versus what was required for simply velocity. And so that extra burden you know, becomes something you have to consider when you're going to take on a validation study around a pump, you know, around a, a device like a centrifugal pump. Uh, next one is then numerical solver error. So in this case, what we're looking at is the impact of solver parameters. So these are things like convergence tolerances for your various degrees of freedom and what you set those to. An example of how you would go through the numerical solver errors, you might set your convergence tolerance for various degrees of freedom to 1e minus 3, and then you would do that again for, to what, uh, by setting that to 1e minus 6 and evaluate the difference in the results that you see. And that can be applied to a number of different tolerances within the code. Um, so in this case, you might look at no parameter sensitivity study was being performed at the lowest risk. Um, in this case, in, in the medium risk, you might say, hey, I have some historical precedent here, which allows me to set those solver parameters based on previous experience. And then finally, uh, at the highest risk, you would go through rigorous uh, analysis of various solver parameters to ensure that you're meeting your accuracy requirements. And then finally, the last credibility factor I have to talk about is use error. So in this case, what we're really worried about is whether or not you made mistakes in setting up the model in terms of the model inputs. Um, this was something that, like in graduate school, drove me insane. I'm, I'm sure many of you had that same kind of thing where you just get lost to whether or not you set this parameter or that parameter correctly, and it took you down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out whether or not you set your problem up correctly or not. Um, we're also worried about mistakes in entering the input data. You know, did we make typographical errors? Do we get a decimal point off, et cetera? But then also looking at the post-processing. Um, were there mistakes made when you extracted that final data from the problem? So again, similar to what we saw before, at the lowest risk, you might ignore uh, use error. At, the, at B, you might do it yourself. So you go through there and just double check that your inputs were acceptable. Um, C, you could go to an internal peer review, so someone on your team who's familiar with the problem and just say, hey, could you take a look at this for me and make sure I set it up correctly? And then finally, at, at the highest level, you might reproduce those simulations to an external peer review to see if we're getting the reproducibil reproducibility of those simulations um, externally. So really, in the end, you know, what, what, what we like to highlight here, it's the modeler's responsibility around verification. You need to understand those verification requirements. You have to plan and execute verification activities. And then it's also important to communicate the need and importance of verification uh, when you're taking on these problems. Um, we, need to uh, we need to do that with you know, everybody that's involved in the team, R&D team, management, clinicians, et cetera. And that's important because these activities do take time. They take time and resources to execute. And it's something we don't want to shortcut because the last thing we want to happen is that you know, we're blind to some of these verification requirements and they wind up hitting us in the face, you know, right towards the end of a project because we made a mistake that was maybe difficult to identify early on in the problem. Um, so with that, then I will conclude and turn things over to Payman. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> yep. All right. See if I can share my screen. Um, oh, there you I gotta stop <clears throat> sharing. Hold on. There you go. It's, on, it's you now. All right. Let me see. There was a screen too. Can you uh, see my screen now? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, sir. Are. All right. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, I don't do the introduction, of course. Uh, so let's uh, let's talk about validation. I'll go through the. Um, um, let me just minimize. I will go through a few slides uh, to elucidate the role of validation in our 
um, credibility assessment journey. <clears throat> so as uh, per uh, VMV40, this, the validation is defined as the process, um, <clears throat> the process of assessing the degree to which the computational model is an appropriate representation of the reality of interest. So bef basically before we release the model to be used in the context of use domain for actually to answer the question of interest, we hit the tires in the proving grounds uh, to see if the predictions are as expected. And that's done through the, the comparison with experimental models. <clears throat> So uh, as uh, Jeff already mentioned, uh, validation, you have the three main uh, elements, the computational model, the comparator, and the assessment. And each one, uh, there's an associated uh, credibility uh, ex activity which are determining their, uh, the, their, uh, the level of credibility. <clears throat> For the computational model is the model form and model inputs. And for comparator, we uh, is uh, the test samples and the test condition, and the assessment will uh, um, with uh, with assess the uh, the equivalency of the inputs and the outputs between the uh, validation between the model and the uh, experiment. So to elucidate uh, to help this visualize the validation process build better maybe and higher risk the reality of interest, which is. Uh, Represented through experimental model, um, uh, compared. Uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Uh, I'll um, I show it with the, with this uh, image. So uh, we have the two. We have the experimental model, and we have the computational model. The, and the the aim is to to uh, relate the model computational model to the experimental model. How well does it represent the reality of interest? Just to make, to make sure to understand the experimental model is intense to represent a reality interest. That's why we call it the model as well. And <clears throat> so the comparator is the whole domain, right? Of the, of the experiment. Yeah, that includes many things, maybe even not, maybe more than even the device itself. And the model form is our, 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 our um, uh, virtual or uh, physical representation of that. Model. It's, it's a numerical representation of that um, comparator domain. And so the inputs are the test samples and test conditions for the comparator. You know, what are the, what are the device and how are we testing it? Uh, and the, for the simulation, everything is under one, um, which we call it the model input, which is basically the same, uh, covers the same uh, inputs of the, what, what is the geometry per se, and what's the, uh, what is the uh, condition that's being tested on there. And we have a simulation, which is an instance of the, of the computational model being executed, same thing with the experiment. So we have, uh, we have an output from the experiment and an output from the simulation. So the assessment portion is really deals with the, the inputs and outputs and how we, <clears throat> and how do we think they relate and how well do we think they relate in terms of uh, helping us to assess the, the, uh, the validation of the model. And once we're done, we're, if, if, if it meets our requirements, then we, uh, we can, then we'll forward it to applicability, which was gonna compare it to the um, uh, evaluated, assess it if it's, released, if it's applicable to the context of use domain. So which Linda will talk about that. <clears throat> so for, to elucidate this better, we can start with, um, uh, with the stat. Uh, so the question is, the question of interest is, does the stent family meet radial positive loading fatigue requirements for the intent, uh, for the indicated use? So it's definitely fit for fatigue strength, uh, and we have some fatigue requirements that specified. Uh, the context of use is, um, <clears throat> is the final element model of each uh, of diameter of the proposed stent. So we have a stent, many diameters, so we have a stent different size, and we have different boundary conditions. So the combination of stent size and boundary condition will create a worst, the, the lowest fatigue safety factor, which we call it worst case identification. And so, and then once we're done, uh, as Jeff showed, the next step is, does the combination will be tested in, my, in, in this case uh, for durability? So we have simulation, 
uh, the model, computational model will like, help with identify the worst case. And then the uh, the additional evidence will be generated using the te uh, with the, uh, through testing uh, to determine uh, the, the the actual fatigue resistance of the worst case. <clears throat> so uh, in, in our case, based on our uh, uh, our based on uh, our um, um, harms and and uh, uh, in our, based on our quality system on the harm, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the uh, model influence has been determined to be a, a B and a decision consequence also determined to be a, a could result in minor patient injury, meaning that if, if you're in making an incorrect decision, if the device makes a, uh, if the simulation makes it, helps with making an incorrect decision, that would be minor uh, impact because we believe that uh, the testing uh, that is done uh, will complement uh, will, will reduce the 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 the, the uh, <clears throat> sorry I'm saying it backwards the model influence in this case um, the decision consequence does not change decision consequence is fixed it has nothing really to do with model it's the wrong uh, it's the wrong decision the model influence in this case is going to be a moderate factor because we have additional testing that will uh, <clears throat> reduce the the influence of model. So, <clears throat> um, uh, the model form. So, in uh, the the, the first thing in in the uh, uh, the on the, on the competition model is the model form. The model form is um, okay. I lost my screen. One second. Okay. The model form is what are the model form assumptions? Uh, so, in this case, would be contact formulation. Uh, the constitutive model, what 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 uh, material model we using? The boundary condition, for instance, are we using symmetry? Uh, loading condition is it real or simplified? <clears throat> and um, what is the deep, uh, and and if you look at the gradation, we talk about the the influence of model from assumption was form was not explored. Basically, we have a model. We're not looking at different models that can be used. We already have, could be based on experience or could be based on our limited uh, knowledge. Uh, and B is influence of uh, expected key model form assumptions were, were explored. Uh, and the last one is the comprehensive evaluation of model form assumptions was conducted. <clears throat> so what is the difference between key and comprehensive? The key typically comes from experience uh, that you already know the uh, the uh, uh, could come from sensitivity analysis could come from your key uh, from your experience that what are the key uh, um, parameters that 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 builds your model right um, <clears throat> so uh, known or likely to be influential comprehensive means all key but it's typically it can never be all key but it generally most uh, you, that you uh, you you explore the impact of your um, Assumptions that's on 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 the on the on the key parameters that build your assumption. So in our for the stent uh, geometry, uh, we say it's a nominal component geometry, uh, and, and we do simplification of features. So uh, that's model form assumption. Uh, you know what type of contact, what kind of frictional contact, even what type of frictional model uh, we use. Um, do we use symmetry or not? And uh, so, do we have the properties, say, for for, for the material? Um, is it idealized? Uh, the boundary condition is it idealized, or is it coming from a uh, a rigid platens, right? So, uh, the next activity on model input is uh, the uh, uh, sensitive sensitivity analysis. Does the perturbing um, of the inputs. So a perturbation of model input, how does the pertur perturbation of inputs impact your output? So the proposed gradation activities are quantification of sensitivities. Sensitivity analysis uh, was not performed, so that's the lowest grade that you can do anything uh, to all the way to sensitivity, comprehensive sensitivity analysis was performed. Um, <clears throat> example of model input, there is material parameters, geometry dimensions, and coefficient of friction. So the model input is what uh, what you need to um, 
to basically perform a simulation. <clears throat> Credibility factor uh, next is the uh, um, quantification of uncertainties. So we've we've done the sensitivity analysis. Now we go to the answer uh, to the uncertainty side of the quanti quantification of uncertainties. So the sensitivity analysis is really me meant to um, is to identify if how sensitive your uh, outputs are into your input. And, and basically, you you the, the goal of that is if to to identify the key parameters that are sensitive. And the, the U cube, the uncertainty quantification, really try to figure out whether the the um, what's what's under your control, what's what is what is real with your say for your dimensions, you know, your tolerance, <clears throat> or your you know your uh, friction. So, for instance, for for friction coefficient, you might um, you may not know your uh, fr friction coefficient. Your sense and you first perform sensitivity analysis, and the sensitivity states that a Maybe that that uh, you know you you change the coefficient of friction and you find your your system is not uh, sensitive to friction, so therefore on your U UQ, you do not you do not you do not need to identify your actual friction coefficient, so you can go you can go along with the, the assumptions on on uh, on your UQ, but if you find a, that your friction is an important uh, key parameter and your device is important to the to the output. Then you have to go and um, and uh, establish, determine your friction coefficient. But you can imagine that there's a cost and time associated with determining uh, experimentation for, say, for friction. So the sensitivity analysis helps with you identify where you're going to put your resources and what's important. And the UQ will be actually the actual range that you have to propagate through your model and use that in your uh, for evaluation. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so um, in, in this case, uh, the uh, okay, I will skip that because uh, for the stand model we looked at the inputs, the material geometry, the, all the interactions, the quantity of interest, which is the output in this case, the radial pressure loading curve, and the sensitivity analysis is the perturbation inputs. And the uncertainty is the actual range of inputs and the distribution of uh, and its its distribution of quantity of interest. How your what quantity of interest your output is uh, uh, is impacted by your um, variation in your input uncertainty. <clears throat> so uh, now we go to the test side. On the test side, uh, the quantity of test samples. Uh, whether you use a single uh, 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 test sample, whether you have multiple test samples, but not to be significantly relevant, or a statistically relevant number of samples were used. Uh, <clears throat> so in this case, the total sample, is this the total samples? No, it refers to the, the total, uh, the number of samples per validation point. So you might have multiple validation point, but it's how many samples are used per validation point. And um, statistically relevant mean that's is that can you claim that you're representing the population? Uh, do you need a minimum quantity of sample for a comparison uh, or of distribution between the comparison and the model? Do you have enough? <clears throat> the range of characteristics of test samples. Um, so uh, here is 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 that um, it. it is the is it, it's similar to basically model input? What measures uh, what measure of material properties would define the sample relative to another? Uh, does this refer to manufacturing value? Which you know this re, uh, this is really about the the range of test samples. Did you have say um, in this case? Do you have the bookends right? The the are you are you exploring multiple uh, geometries, multiple sizes? Like in in the worst case, you have a multiple family. Would you? Uh, but it's not really about the the, the variability within the, the dimensions, but the intentional dimension change, right? You have a smaller or larger device, which gives you additional validation points. So for, for instance, um, in our case, we kept the wall thickness the same, but you can, and, and we change in the strop 
width. So, but you can see there's variability within each strut width. Uh, but the, the wall thickness is not, we, we keep it constant, but within that constant, there is the, uh, that, now you can see the range of characteristics, uh, uh, which is the tolerance band. Uh, <clears throat> so here's is where the, we make the measurements of the tolerance band. Uh, did we did we actually measure or we, we, we assume everything in nominal and uh, where the all characteristics were measured. So and this also uh, uh, relates to quantity of interest as well. Right? Are, are, are we measuring the variability in the in the, the output? <clears throat> So next uh, on the um, next to this, uh, is the uncertainty of test sample measurements. Um, so that has to do with the with the actual um, uh, the the sample, the me the measurement system, uh, and the uncertainty on the uh, and, and if we did a, a UQ study, UQ analysis. Um, we including that includes the instrument, the accuracy, repeatability, and other condition affecting the measurement. <clears throat> Again, that includes the output, and um, and, <clears throat> and and that includes the output. I'm sorry. Comparator test conditions um, refers to uh, the uh, the defined uh, defined set of inputs: temperature. Uh, speed, etc. So, are we did we change anything, or is it a single loading condition? So, in this case, uh, for for um, or or did we have multiple loading conditions, or um, uh, or in this case, say our gradations? Did we have more than four test conditions? So, in in this case, we have a single test condition, which is a radial uh, pressure testing. So, it's a single test condition. Uh, and and where do we uh, and are we are we uh, in, in terms of credit credibility is it an A or is it B? It's probably not C, uh, but it's a, it's a single test condition. It's probably A, right? So and range of test condition did we change the, our test? Uh, so is is it a single test at a single pressure? For instance, did we change? Uh, a range of conditions. Did we change the pressure? Did we uh, our measurements uh, uh, pressure A, pressure B, and pressure C, and um, or, or or is the pressure say or, or the test condition represent extremes again the ex extreme ex expected extreme conditions, <clears throat> and uh, okay I over over and over that uh, so. And then the, the, for the measurement, I'm not saying test condition is very similar to test sample characterization. It um, it's, goes from either nothing to key characteristics. So the assessment, now, now that we've done, we have the data, we have, the, we have uh, uh, an idea about the input, the variability of the input, the variability and the, out, uh, and the inputs from both, but from the test and from the experiment. Now we did the assessment. Uh, then we compare the, the the inputs and the outputs. Where 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 did we have the similar? Were they, were they similar or they were dissimilar? Were the inputs similar or dissimilar? For instance, if the uh, for, for for in our case, of course, the measurements uh, we have a stent on the radial loading uh, uh, and a pressure loading, and then uh, is it similar between the test and, and simulation? <clears throat> Or they were similar, but they, these ranges were different. Or both the tests, both both the uh, uh, the, the the setup in the in the range of the inputs for for the uh, test and the uh, simulation, where they all uh, similar are the same <clears throat> or equivalent. And the same thing for the output. So a single output was uh, compared, multiple outputs were compared, and uh, the equivalence of output parameters. Types of outputs were similar. So for instance, if you are, uh, uh, your, your output is a displacement and your quantity of interest is, let's say stress, so you're, you're, you're comparing the stresses from, uh, you're, you're comparing your displacements from the test 
to the simulation. So you can say that yeah, the, 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 the outputs were, uh, were similar, uh, but say you don't have say strain data. So, if, but if, if, if you have strain versus strain, yes, then your outputs are similar. Okay, so uh, the output comparison, uh, the rigor of outputs comparison. So whether uh, you, uh, when you really look at the data, did you compare them, the, the input, the outputs from the simulation to, uh, to the, um, uh, to the uh, experiment, whether, whether they're the same or not. It, 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 uh, whether the, that's done through visual comparison, uh, you could see that for, um, um, seeing that for, um, uh, for MRI or feeding, you sometimes see that you use the, uh, the, um, the visual between how does the, say the E-field looks like inside the phantom um, to a, a simulation prediction, and that could be sufficient, or did you actually go a measurement of the field, uh, <clears throat> the E-field uh, at local locations, and depending on, on what you, um, depending on the, uh, on the, on the uh, your um, credibility requirements, you either have, you, you might be doing a visual comparison all the way to, um, uh, uh, to do uh, a full uncertainty analysis of the output. Uh, and then the, the, the agreement, do you think the level of agreement between the output and the input was satisfactory? Uh, do you find the level of agreement on the output comparison uh, and the key parameters, key compare, uh, um, are, are satisfactory for key parameters, but not all uh, comparisons. And developer agreement for the output comparison was satisfactory for all comparisons. All right, um, I'll, um, I think I'm done. Um, I'll stop sharing and Linda, please go ahead with the applicability. Thank you. Great, thanks, Payman. Uh, I would like to acknowledge all 100 participants who most of them are now, it's after five o'clock on a Friday. So thank you very much for hanging in here. Um, we feel this is very important and I've spent the last seven years, well, longer than that working on this, but this last seven years applying VNV 40. And so not only do I think it's important, I think it's an excellent tool to communicate. Um, these terms that we have um, showed you in the upper right hand corner, what we've gone through verification, validation and applicability. This is a communication tool. And once you have answers to these, you're doing the work anyway, just at the end, then you know people are going to agree or disagree, you know what you have to do. So thanks for hanging in there. Um, if you haven't applied the standard yet and uh, want to do it, I don't want you to think it's daunting. You're doing this work anyway. You're asking these questions anyway. This just gives you a list and a framework in which to do them. So now all the work that you've seen, is it applicable? And I would encourage some of, one of the questions uh, we frequently get is, you know, where do you start on, on this? How do you even get started with this? And I can tell you from experience, you do not want to start by doing applicability last. You want to consider that and bring it up front. Um, if in applicability, as you can see here, is the relevance of the validation evidence used to support the model for a context of use. That's really the point of why we did all this work. And when you have that relevance, you we have two uh, credibility factors, uh, the quantities of interest and the validation conditions. And we wanna show that the, the differences are not so great that we couldn't have all of our validation evidence be applicable to the context of use domain. So really this, um, I would encourage you to think of this factor and the sub factors in the beginning so that you know you're, you're going um, there. On this screen, uh, the graphic you see came from Pross's, uh, Pross and others, their paper, which the reference is at the bottom there, which I found really useful to understand what applicability is. Pross is going to be speaking, I think, on Monday from the FDA. 
um, you have a validation domain and that's exactly what Payment just discussed. There's a computational model. Um, so that's the model in the validation domain and you have a comparator and that's the reality. And from both of these, you have quantities of interest. So in the test, in this case, the bench top test we've been referring to, you have a measured quantity of interest. And then from the computational model, you have a calculated quantity of interest. And the last thing payment touched on was the assessment. That's comparing the comparator to the computational model outputs. And what we now want to do is take that up into our context of use domain. So let's give, um, in that context of use domain, you're going to have both have a computational model and then the reality, testing, or maybe even further abstracted, but in this case, let me share an example. In this case, uh, very similar to the context of use that Jeff presented in the very beginning, we're going to use a um, computational model to identify the worst case size of a series of tibial trays. And one of those tibial trays, uh, once we determine the worst case size, will be tested to fatigue. So how relevant is the validation evidence to support that for the context of use. And I'm gonna go through two, both of the factors individually. I might point out um, before I go further. So here's the computational model was done by a static load compared to a static test. And we only did that on one size. And then there are multiple sizes that we're gonna be using it just to point out a few factors on this page. This also, I mentioned, I've been working on this for um, not only in my own work or my company's work, but also as an end-to-end -end example that is uh, in ballot now. So this is the example that is in the um, upcoming ASME pre um, publication. So if we look at the quantities of interest, the relevance, and again, I keep that horizontal line to indicate all the work we've done so far below that, the validation domain, the gradation of factors from lowest to highest would be the validation activities were related, though not act identical, a subset were identical, and then all of them were identical. And in this case, the quantities of interest that come out here are stiffness, we have a stiffness result, then we need to extrapolate that or have a good rationale. Um, you might recall that this section, this applicability is under engineering judgment. So this is where communication, uh, understanding upfront how you're going to be using this is really important. Otherwise you could get here and find out that the work you've done is not applicable or not sufficiently applicable. In here, um, then in the computational model in the context of use, we're measuring stress. You can see a maximum one run that model on all seven of the tibial tray sizes, and then use that to extrapolate fatigue performance and indicate um, which one would fracture first. So in this case, the activities we can, through engineering rationale, show that stiffness is certainly related to stress, which is also related then to the fatigue performance, but they're not identical. We're not getting the same outputs of quantity of interest. And that's pretty common in medical devices. Um, they're not always identical. You might not be able to measure those. You might not be able to um, implant in human subjects. You can't, um, you have to use surrogates and that, that happens frequently. Uh, the second factor under applicability is the relevance of the validation conditions to the context of use. And let's look at this in, um, on the graph on the right is from VNV40. And right now I'd like you just to look at the black dots that are the validation points. So those are the test points. You may only have one test point, but for now in, in the VNV40 standard, this is the chart that's there. Looking at those black dots, you see one variable was uh, varied or tested from a minimum to a maximum, I guess five different locations here. And a second variable was changed between a low and a high value there, right? three different levels. So those are your validation points. And then how relevant are those? This is a very good way to see how close your context of use is to those by overlapping them. So now go ahead and look at, let's say context of use three, 
where there is no overlap between, this is the points that you're going to use it for in your context of use, there's no overlap with either of the ranges, right? That would be a very low level of your confidence in the applicability and of, of your model. Whereas context of use two, now you're overlapping all the ranges of this variable, but not in this variable. And then in context of use one, you have overlap of it, of all those points. If we take a look at what is quite common in the orthopedic space with this worst case size, same graphic on the left here, my context of use domain, as I mentioned, are seven different sizes and dynamic loading. And that loading now, let's look, we'll, varies from 90 to 900 newtons. So let's say here's the load here, 90 to 900 newtons. And on the horizontal axis could be the size, all seven sizes here. So we tested one point. So there is our validation point. We get one of the fried eggs, as I like to call them. And the next um, area, what we need to do is consider our context of use needs to cover this entire space. So do you think the validation of that one point indicated where the two yellow lines come together is sufficient uh, ap applicability for your complete context of use? Certainly the point is within your context of use. Another thing we could describe would be that the applied load was the highest in that range. So you would have more confidence. You're using it also within the range here. Um, Maybe you're not using the highest sizes, but the area of interest is really the same across all sizes. So that fillet radius right at the base where the maximum principal stress is, is really the highest and very similar across the geometries. Those are the discussions you can have on an engineering judgment as far as the relevance of the validation activities. So in conclusion for applicability, we covered the two factors that make up the applicability section. And it really is emphasizing what the difference is between how the model is validated and how it's used is. And again, having that discussion. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to wrap this up for us. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Linda. Let me share my screen here. Okay, is that coming through okay? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, great. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of talking over the past hour and a half, uh, a little bit more talking. I'm going to abbreviate the end a little bit, um, just focus on a couple things so we can get into uh, the Q&A. Uh, we've had a number of questions come in via chat or Q&A that I think are relevant and wanna to speak to those. And then I uh, would encourage anyone else who has uh, questions that have come up anywhere along the past hour, hour and a half, go ahead and throw those in and we will, we will try and address those with the panel uh, once we conclude here. So a, a, lot of, a lot of details, let's take a step back again and make sure we haven't lost the, the forest from the trees. So the, the guts of VNV40 as I see it is, remains the ideas of, of context of use, model risk, and credibility, right? Context of use is I want to do some modeling stuff, right, to address a question because I think it's going to be useful. But be clear on exactly what you want to address, all the different sources of evidence that you're going to bring into bear beyond just the model results to address that question, and consider very carefully the impact of that question in terms of, of patient harms. Once you have that COU defined, then you can evaluate the model risk. Um, and the contributors to model risk are model influence and decision consequence. One of the questions that came in, which I will address now, is how do you address model influence and decision consequence? First thing to do is to make sure in your mind and on paper, right, you have a clearly stated context of use. It all starts from there. If you have that, then you should be able to evaluate, well, what am I bringing in to inform this, this question? I'm going to bring in model results. I'm going to bring in maybe some, uh, some test data. Maybe I'm going to bring in some clinical data. Um, maybe I'm going to compare to a predicate system. 
right? Very typically in the device space, there are a lot of different sources of evidence that we bring in to finally render a decision on what we think is, is the, the safety of the device for a particular failure mode. So all those factor into model influence. So when you want to evaluate model influence, you can take the scales as they are listed in BNB40, which is a representative set of scales. You can come up with your own set of levels for model influence and maybe have a little bit more specificity. And then once you define those, then you take your COU and see where you land on model influence. Decision consequence is very much the same thing. Uh, we have a set of gradations in VNV40 that you can use to evaluate decision consequence. One thing that I would want to make clear, which I don't think we've stated so far, is decision consequence is, is really, I say really, it is independent of how you're using the model, right? It's independent of the other sources of evidence that, that are coming in. Decision consequence strictly has to do with what is the failure mode that you're addressing within the device? And what is the impact of that failure mode on a patient? Some of us are working in life-sustaining devices. Some of us are dealing with life-enabling devices. Some of us may be dealing with cosmetic devices or very low-impact devices, right? All these sorts of things impact decision consequence. And so you wanna evaluate those independently, model influence, decision consequence, then fold those into an evaluation of risk. Now, once you have risk, then that drives, right, the level of rigor of all the different things that Mark and Payman and Linda talked about in, in great detail over the past hour. All those contribute to overall credibility. And so within that, right, we have the, the, the bucket of activities around verification, and you can look at code and calculation. You can look at the two different contributors to code, the three different contributors for calculation, if you're a manufacturer, right, if you're an ap applicator of, of the modeling, you should probably go through and make sure I'm going to address each one of these five contributors to verification. You can look at the standard, you can see what the scales are, you can think about the risk and come up with a plan to execute to that plan. As a regulator, you can do very much the same thing. So you want to address, well, was verification adequately addressed? Go through each one of these and make sure that that has been properly considered within the associated risk of the, of the application. Um, so you have the verification bucket, then you have the validation bucket, right? So we've done some validation activities. We have some, some model results that we're comparing to experimental results in some way. We have certain aspects of credibility associated with the model. We have some associated with the comparator. And then we have some that speak to the level of agreement between the two, both in terms of inputs and outputs, right? That's the, that's the validation bucket. And then finally, as, as Linda ended with, it's the applicability. So it's, it's great that we've done some benchtop experiments. It's great that we've done some models of those benchtop experiments. It's great that maybe they seem to look pretty good relative to each other, right? But how closely connected is that set of validation activities to the actual context of use that we're looking at in terms of devices, geometries, materials, loading conditions, all the different things that factor into the actual context of use for the application. And so if you keep this, if you keep this mapping in mind, right, and then you can then you can drill in and go into as much detail as you'd like for each of these individual factors, ensure that the detail is there. Okay. Um, this is the workflow we've seen a couple of times. Uh, the only point that I want to make here is that in some of the really interesting emerging applications of modeling simulation, like patient-specific modeling, like in silico clinical trials, these modeling efforts generally take several years to do in practice. And so before you want to do those sorts of studies, you probably want to make sure that you have a credibility pathway. And so this is, I think these are applications where you really want to do this work prospectively before you invest a ton of time and resources on applying that to address whatever it is that you want to finally address. There are a lot of other applications where the credibility activities, the credibility evidence may already be on file, right? Because none of us are really starting from scratch. We have literature, we have prior history within our companies. We have a lot of things that are already in place. And so in practice, we may be pulling on retrospective information, retrospective model results, retrospective clinical data or experimental results 
to demonstrate whether or not we have sufficient credibility already without even potentially having to do additional activities to support the COU. So that's the, uh, that's the point of this slide here. Um, and this is the final one that I think I wanna belabor uh, a little bit just in terms of managing expectations. So as I said in the beginning, uh, we've given a lot of facts about what the standard is, um, but there is subjectivity here and there is the importance for each individual to think carefully about what they're doing and not look at BNV 40 as addressing all the difficult questions, right? It provides a framework to address those questions, but it's not gonna answer them for you. So I have here a, a couple of comparative points of things that the standard does and things that the standard does not do. Um, so the first one is that very clearly, we have an independent assessment of decision consequence and model influence when assessing model risk, right? Two independent factors. What VNV40 does not do though, is provide a specific functional relationship that links model risk to decision consequence and model influence. This is something that each individual manufacturer, each individual company needs to define within their quality system and then apply it um, in practice. What VNV40 does is once we have that risk, right, think carefully about how we wanna modulate all the different credibility activities based on that model risk. That link between risk and credibility is essential to VNV40. But what VNV40 does not do is tell you exactly what that mapping should be. Again, this is the area where the individual manufacturer needs to come up with this within their risk management system to define how to translate overall model risk to the appropriate level of credibility for each of the factors that are laid out within the VNV40 standard. And a third point is um, while VNV40 does provide examples on how to establish gradation levels for each credibility factor, for each factor that we presented here, there are some proposed levels. We do not mandate that structure. So there is room, again, for each individual manufacturer um, to come up with a specific structure that is as specific as they want it to be for their domain within the medical device space define that structure, define the levels, define the gradations, and then apply it across the spectrum of applications uh, that you see day to day. And so the final point of this is, yes, we, we have very clearly, we've established a framework for assessing risk-based model credibility that should facilitate discussion and agreement among all the stakeholders for modeling and simulation, but it is not finally a prescriptive recipe, right? Where either a, an analyst or a regulator can check out of thinking carefully about what we're doing. We still have to think carefully, but here's a framework um, by which to, to guide those thinkings. Okay. Um, so briefly now on these, um, some things that we've learned in practice since the publication of the standard in 2018. Um, for a lot of these applications, we are looking not just at a single set of benchtop data for validation. We may be looking at real world data. We may be looking at clinical data. We may be looking at multiple benchtop experiments. These sorts of complexities, we're still trying to tease out. Um, we have a publication that came from the group a couple of years ago, specifically about how one might use real world data. And we have some additional work coming out soon that will talk about different types of comparators that can be used um, to support uh, credibility for medical device applications. That's something that is still coming out. When we published the standard in 2018, as I mentioned, about half of it is devoted to examples because we realized even at that time uh, that we need examples to take the, the theory and put it into practice. Um, those examples are not perfect. Um, we've also seen that over time. And so there are a couple efforts that are still underway very shortly. Hopefully we will have a detailed technical report um, which is sort of like one of these examples, but it goes through every possible aspect of VNV40 in practice. Um, so this technical report is in the balloting stage right now. Hopefully that will come out um, potentially before the end of the year and, and should help in practice. The other thing that we've seen in practice is that even the standard itself, there are things we can improve on. And so it's an active work item within the VVQ40 subcommittee uh, to revise this. That's still going to be um, a couple years away in practice, I think, um, but we have a lot of inputs in the community 
that's motivating an improvement to the standard as it's currently written. We are also focused on emergent applications, right? So not everything we do is, is worst case analysis. One of the very interesting areas in medical devices right now and planning and diagnosis is the use of patient specific models. Um, we know and a variety of people know that BNB40 in its current form may require a little bit of finesse to apply to patient specific models. So we have a working group that's specifically looking at providing some of those ideas about how you can take the standard in its current form and apply it in practice for uh, patient-specific models, including things like software as a medical device. Um, we have also seen in practice that the, the scope of VNV40 is slowly creeping out. And so coming back to this uh, three-tiered um, view of context of use and model risk and credibility, the scope as it's written in the standard is, as you see here, the scope of the standard encompasses physics-based computational models used for medical device applications. Um, I'm going to start picking apart each of these. So we very much focused on context of use around medical device applications. What we've seen is, is a lot of other sectors also are very interested in what we are doing here. Um, there's a lot of aspects of VNV40 that are not necessarily specific to medical device applications. Um, so that's an area where we're seeing uh, the application of, of VNV40 creep a little bit from the scope as it was currently defined. A second one is uh, the way we framed model risk, right? It's the use of computational models. This is also addressing one of the questions that came up in the background during the course of this webinar. Um, the, the idea of, of model risk, right, is, is framed around the results from the model are one component of evidence that's addressing the question of interest around the COU. There are other types of evidence as well. We are typically, as mentioned, we are bringing in benchtop data, we are bringing in perhaps clinical data, um, there may be a variety of things coming into play. The idea of risk can be associated with each of those different sources of evidence, right? In the same way that model influence is a contributor to risk, you can think about the influence of all these other sources of evidence as well. Um, I don't think that's fully permeated into the space of these other sources of evidence. Um, but there are certainly some activities in the larger ecosystem to try and take this idea of risk and expand it to um, other types of evidence, uh, evidences that we use. And the third one is uh, physics based. Um, so when we when we developed this in 2018, based on even starting around 2010, there was a lot of people who were active in physics based simulations. Um, so solid mechanics and computational fluid dynamics and similar to that. Um, and the credibility factors as they're laid out are very much tuned to physics-based simulations. But there's obviously a lot of interest nowadays, a lot of interest in applications around uh, machine learning and database methods. And so there's, there's a lot of thinking right now about how the credibility factors as laid out right now, can they apply in their current form to these other sorts of modeling approaches? Or can we modify the specific credibility factors so that they are more suited to database models while still fitting within the context of a COU risk credibility paradigm. Um, some, other, some other references here, um, not gonna belabor this. This will be in the recording, so you can take a look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, a big thank you to all the people who contributed to the publication of the standard in 2018. A big thank you to all the people who are contributing to support the VVUQ uh, 40 subcommittee since then. You see here a smattering of all the different entities uh, a lot of support um, from regulators, from manufacturers, from academicians uh, to support this. Um, we all still share the belief, right, that the modeling simulation, we can do more with it to, to get the right things out to patients. And, and the, the, the standards that we have here and continuing things in the, in the pre-competitive space um, will help to, uh, to, to do this. So with that, I think we are at the extent, at the end of the presentation part of it. 